from Peter Boghossian's book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. There we go. Start recording. All right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. I'm just getting the live going. Um, I don't have a lot of time before I have to go make supper. I'm getting a little hungry already. Uh, but I'm going to read the first, actually the second chapter in Peter Boghossian's book, uh, How to Have Impossible Conversations by Peter Boghossian and Lims, uh, James Lindsay. Um, the first chapter is basically, why do we want to have conversations? What is, you know, what's the point? And it's pretty self-explanatory. Why would he be writing a book otherwise? And then in chapter two, he cracks right into the important bits. And that's where we're going to start. <clears throat> chapter two, page nine. The seven fundamentals of good conversations. And I just posted a really quick video, like 15 second video of a picture of this. So everyone has it to refer to. <clears throat> and I like writing things down. Uh, you know, I keep notes all the time, just flip through them, like before I have these kind of conversations. I know, super nerdy. Uh, uh, one sec, I need, need something else. Here we go. All right, 127. Welcome, everyone. What are we reading? We are reading from Chapter 2 in Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay, How to Have Impossible Conversations. It's just perfect for being a TikTok uh, egghead <laughs> talking about philosophy and stuff. Anyway, okay. <clears throat> How to converse with anyone, from strangers to prison inmates. Here are the seven fundamentals to good conversations. I'm going to add a number eight. Delicious tea. Tea is a fundamental. Number one, goals. Why are you engaging in this conversation? Number two, partnership. Be partners, not adversaries. I want to dive into that one a little more later. Report. Develop and maintain a good connection. Um, number four. Listen. Listen more. Talk less. Number five. Shoot the messenger. That's a tricky one. And seven. Number seven. Walk away. Don't push your conversation partner beyond their comfort zone. <clears throat> then a, a quick um, uh, quote by... Madeline Albright, Madeline Albright, you think that you've heard, uh, you think that the heads of state only have serious conversations, but they actually often begin really with whether or not I really like your tie. <clears throat> Everything is based on fundamentals. Everything. If you are able to ex execute a complex maneuver in ballet, for example, it is because you understand basic elements of the art. All expertise is built upon fundamentals. Engage in civil and effective conversations is a skill. It takes knowledge and practice, and you'll need to begin with fundamental principles. Later, when, we, <clears throat> when they become ingrained, you'll want to have to think about their use. They'll come naturally. Uh, you won't have to think about their use. They'll come naturally. But without them, you can expect frequent upsets, derailed conversations, and strained relationships. Most basic elements of civil discussion, especially over matters of substantive disagreement, come down to a single theme, making the other person in the conversation a partner, not an adversary. To accomplish this, you need to understand what you want from the conversation, make charitable assumptions about others' intentions, listen, and seek back and forth interactions, as opposed to delivering a message. Learning to listen is the first step in the give and take of effective conversations. You'll need to overcome the urge to say everything that's on your mind. Finally, you'll need to know when to end the conversation gracefully. <clears throat> I 
I'm going to keep a heads up for anyone that wants to come in and chat real quick. I do want to keep reading. I've only got about an hour today. But uh, if you want to make a quick comment or ask a question, then uh, yeah, I'm available. <clears throat> in all, <clears throat> this chapter teaches seven, seven fundamentals for good conversations. Identifying your goals, forming partnerships, developing a report, listen, uh, rapport, listening to the other person in the conversation, shooting your own messenger, that is, not delivering your own truth, keeping in mind the other person's intentions, which are probably better than you assume, and knowing when to walk away. Okay, this goes on for a while. I want to jump right into goals. <clears throat> What's the purpose? People enter into conversations for vastly different reasons. Often, people just want to talk and connect. But <clears throat> at other times, more functional goals are at work. These include any of the following. Reaching mutual understanding. Uh, learning from each other. Finding truth. Intervening. Impressing. Or yielding to cohesion. In each case... If you first identify your conversational goals, then your path will become easier. Ask yourself, why am I having this discussion? What are my goals? What do I want to get out of this? Your answer might be any of the instances above, or you might just want to keep your conversations light, friendly, and agreeable. <clears throat> Tea time. <laughs> Okay, skipping ahead. Partnership. <clears throat> Number two. Um, during the 1970s, Peter Men Peter's mentor, uh, speaking of Peter Bogosian's mentor, Portland State University, University, bleh, University psychology professor Dr. Frank Wesley investigated why some U.S. prisoners of war, POWs, defected to North Korea during the World War. His research showed that virtually all of the defectors came from a single U.S. training camp. As part of their training, they had been taught that the North Koreans were cruel, heartless barbarians who des uh, despised the United States and single-mindedly sought its destruction. But when those POWs were shown kindness by their captors, their initial, their initial indoctrination unraveled. They became far more likely to defect than those POWs who either didn't or hadn't been told anything about the North Koreans or had been given more neutral accounts of them. Conversation partners. <clears throat> hmm. I'm going to skip ahead. A lot of this is... Mm, I don't have a lot of time, and everyone should buy and read the book themselves. <clears throat> you may be saying to yourself, I can talk to a lot of people like a partner, but I couldn't do that with a racist, for example. Yes, you can. If a, if a black musician, Daryl Davis, can have civil conversations with Klansmen and help them abandon the KKK, then he can, and he can, uh, he has a closet full of their relinquished hoods to prove it. This is an interesting study. If no one has ever heard of Daryl Davis, um, Check him out on YouTube. He's been interviewed a lot as a person who talks very racist Klansmen into giving up their uh, participation and their physical hoods and robes and stuff. And, and Daryl, I guess, keeps them as <laughs> trophies of a sort. Um, kind of morbid, but a really interesting uh, bit of reality. <clears throat> One key to realizing you can have seemingly impossible conversations is recognizing that discussions are neutral, learning environments for both people. Treating an individual as a partner in civil dialogue does not mean accepting their conclusion or buying into their reasoning. <clears throat> it means thinking along with means thinking along with someone so that you understand not just what they believe, but also why they believe it. In that process, maybe they'll come to understand your reasoning, or see that their reasoning is an error, or maybe you'll discover that you're abhorring a false belief. Conversational partnership isn't about agreement or disagreement. It's about civility, charity, and mutual understanding. At worst, 
<clears throat> you'll have to endure hearing someone's truly vile, uh, hearing something truly vile, in which case you will come away from the conversation with a better understanding of why people hold repugnant beliefs. More likely, you'll foster comfortable conversation environments, build relationships, uh, better position yourself in understanding and addressing similar agreements, arguments, and maybe even revising your own thinking. There's a catch, of course. You can't control someone else's behavior. You can only control your own, so you have to be the one who initially attempts to understand your conversation partner's reasoning even if they're unwilling to participate. You'll also have to take an active role in establishing and maintaining the partnership dynamic and be ready to walk away if that becomes impossible. We'll say more on this in, cha in the chapter that follows. This is, um, this is something that hits home for me as a TikTok, you know, debate bro. I'm trying not to be a debate bro. <laughs> I want to foster a better environment for these kind of conversations. How do we actually change people's minds? Um, just, I'm going to go into the weeds for a minute. Uh, there are a lot of TikTokers that talk about religion and how, you know, whether it be yelling at them, showing their rage, telling them that they are stupid, telling them that their ideas are stupid. I sincerely believe that there is a healthy place for all of that. We are all in this endeavor together. And most people will see that, and if they're believers, they'll say, oh my goodness, what are you doing? And they'll not engage. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. If they want to engage, good. If they want to, if they want to have actual, you know, constructive kind of conversations, that's, that's kind of what my goal here is. And it's, um, it's inspired by watching uh, Anthony Magnabosco. When I first saw Anthony Magnabosco, on YouTube, I was blown away by this technique, and that's what led me to Peter Bogosian. And and uh, this book references Anthony Magnabosco in the subchapter coming up soon. So, back to the reading. <clears throat> Literally right here. Report. Anthony Magnabosco is a street epistemologist. Street epistemology applies the famous Soc uh, Socratic method of questioning and other conversation goals and tools to help people reconsider how they know what they think they know. Anthony meant Carrie, K-A-R-I. Oh yeah, and, and this is just the beginning of uh, Anthony's conversation with Carrie, and it's not that substantive, it's just an example of how to build rapport. So when we interact here on TikTok, it's a very different um, scenario than Anthony standing on a, a hiking path, just talking with strangers or talking in the middle of a college campus, right? They're radically different environments. People on typically a TikTok typically hop into a conversation, sometimes say hi or um, say their name or ask their name. Usually it's, it's right into the weeds, right? It's we're just going to we're going to blow the doors open and start debating. Debate, bro. Debate me, bro. Change my mind, bro. <sighs> so building rapport is hard on TikTok, but not impossible. Hmm. Process to build rapport. Yeah, uh, that, again, read the book. I'm skipping over a lot. There's a lot here. Um, I'm trying to hit the highlights right now. Oh, here's a good one. <clears throat> Practices to build rapport. Build rapport immediately. Do not start the conversation with a substantive issue, especially if it's controversial. <laughs> yeah, hi, TikTok. <laughs> if you do not know someone... <clears throat> there are a few obvious initial questions. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, skipping on. Uh, find common ground. There are countless things you can... There are countless things you and your conversation partner have in common. Maybe you're both practice jujitsu, or like sushi, or have tattoos, enjoy science fiction, blah, 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 blah. One automatic commonality about... <laughs> one automatic commonality 
all but psychopaths have in common is the impulse for good. Okay, I'm going to say this again because this is a really good concept to remember. The definition of a psychopath, right? What are they? They exist. They're, there's actually more than you think. One automatic commonality all but psychopaths have in common is the impulse for uh, uh, to do good. You both want the best for yourselves, your friends, and your community. While you might diverge on those outcomes, while you might diverge on what those outcomes would look like, living better lives is a fundamental commonality. Uh, number four, don't parallel park. I actively try not to do this, and I see it all the time. Parallel parking in conversations. Parallel talk... <clears throat> is taking something someone says and using that to reference yourself or your experiences. I do it all the time and it drives myself nuts. For example, if someone tells you that they just got back from Cuba, don't start talking about the time you went to Cuba. Ask them about their experience in Cuba. Don't make the stories about your life. Parallel talk damages rapport. <sighs> That's one of the hardest things I recognize in myself in my conversations that I'm trying to get better at. <clears throat> Number five, invest in the relationship, independent of your political views. Friendship engenders trust and openness, which act like bridges across divides. Remember the adage, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care, as we'll discuss in more detail in chapter three. This ref refers to how much you care about them and the things they care about, not about your political or moral uh, commitments. Number six. Engage in substantive conversations only if you're willing to make time. Do not rush it and do not hit and run. If you can't substantively engage someone's ideas, leave it for, leave it for a time when you can. It impairs rapport for, uh, to forces or speed through conversations. If your time is limited, use moments you have to build rapport to catch up. Uh, number seven. Be ready to talk about something else. You know that Unc you know uh, yeah, be ready to talk about something else. You know that uncle who ruins your family get together is because they just can't leave his religion or politics alone. Don't be that person. If the conversation gets sticky, be ready to change the subject to something less serious. If the conversation has moved on from a contentious issue, don't be the one to bring it back up. Forcing issues destroys rapport. Really good points to make here. Um, it, again, it's different on TikTok because we can just disconnect from the conversation, right? Try again later, for better or worse. But when we're having conversations, difficult conversations with the people in our lives that matter, choose your battles wisely. Don't sacrifice your rapport for winning an argument, especially if your livelihood depends on it. If you're a child or if you know a child who's struggling with their parents and they, they just, they're so frustrated because they think their parents are idiots for believing or doing or whatever, then the best advice you can give is choose your battles wisely. Don't sacrifice your livelihood or your rapport to win argument of argumentative points. Save it for TikTok, where internet points matter. <laughs> Number eight, avoid callouts, except for severe infractions. Calling out someone means telling them, usually immediately, in a harsh way that aims at inducing shame that they have crossed a moral boundary. This is often followed with moral instruction. For example, you should do this, or you shouldn't do that. Calling someone out, especially midstream in their thought, damages rapport. Find a more delicate and better timed way to bring up your concerns. Chances are your partner is doing the best they can do to express their thoughts. Rather than calling out their offense, Try to make sense of what she is saying and appreciate her authenticity, however through, 
however rough around the edges. Of course, if someone is deliberately rude or abusive, you should stand up for yourself, say something and set clear boundaries, or end the conversation. Number nine, be courteous. Say please and thank you. Also say, I appreciate that. Offer someone, <clears throat> after someone offers a counter argument or disagrees with something you've said, ah, I'm sorry, say please and thank you after you disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Not on TikTok. Uh, throw the red meat. <laughs> Everybody likes, you know, the, the really controversial topics get the views, right? Everybody likes that red meat. Everybody loves conflict. Conflict drives views. Dating talk? Hmm. <clears throat> sorry I'm kind of uh, annoyed. Uh, I'm sorry I'm distracted from chat. I don't mean to ignore any of you. I'm just trying to get through this chapter as quickly as I can. <clears throat> All right, I'm just going to say welcome again to everyone who's just joining us. I'm blasting through Chapter 2 in Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay's How to Have Impossible Conversations. And we're talking about the seven, fundamental, the seven fundamentals for good conversation. So we've already talked about goals, partnership, and rapport. Now we're moving on to number four, listening. <clears throat> Think about listening in terms of your own experiences. Who would you rather come over for dinner? Someone who knows everything and is convincing or someone who is a tentative, who is an attentive listener and engages you and makes you feel heard? If you are fortunate enough to have friends who are skilled listeners, then you already know who to invite for dinner. Yeah. I know both. I, I've, had, I've had both as friends, and the, you, you, everyone wants to be heard. So being a good listener is more critical than ever. If you do not listen, you cannot understand. And if you cannot understand, there is no conversation. Listening is more difficult than it seems. So it requires practice. Do what you can to make listening the center of your approach to conversations. Best practices to improve your listening skills. Here are some suggestions. Number one, go. No, you go. If someone starts to speak uh, and you speak at the same time, don't continue speaking. Instead say, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Really, no, you, go. No, 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 you. I want to hear what you say. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, number two, look directly at someone and turn your body towards them. <laughs> number three, unless your partner is searching for a word uh, and you don't... Bleh. Unless your partner is searching for a word and you know it, do not finish their sentences. Listen, don't jump in to speak before having heard and process what they're saying. Listen. Number four, pause. Pauses are crucial moments when people reflect. Do not rush to fill them. Pauses may build trust and rapport while offering you a chance to understand your partner's reasoning. In Western cultures, people tend to be uncomfortable with even a moment of conversation silence. <clears throat> Rather than a problem that needs to be solved, pauses should be viewed as opportunities. A moment of unbroken silence offers a reflection event for participants. Pause. Number five, if you find yourself distracted by something in your immediate environment, either turn your back towards the distraction or explicitly Identify what's distracting to you. This can form a common bond if you're... Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, skip ahead. Number six. If you're unclear about what someone means, place the burden of understanding upon yourself. At a pause point in the discussion, say, I'm not sure that I understand. Can you, can you explain that? I'm sorry. Grandma's calling. I'll be right back. Yeah? 
Yeah, what is it? Hello, I'm back. <sighs> Sorry, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around. Everything is okay. Um, uncle is here looking for some paperwork, so no problem. Oh, book's over here. <clears throat> All right, welcome to everyone who is just joining us. I am very quickly reading through the second chapter of Peter Vigosian and James Lindsay's How to Have Impossible Conversations. I have about half an hour left before I need to log off and go make supper. So thank you all for being here. Um, very, very excited to be reading to a group of like over 40 people. <laughs> You're all fantastic. Uh, nerds unite. <laughs> Don't forget good tea. <clears throat> Um, real quick, for those of you just joining, we're talking about the seven fundamentals of good conversations. And I just posted a very like short 15 second video about the seven fundamentals. So we can all review whenever you want. Ah, please buy a copy of this. Send them your appreciation because having good conversations is so critical. <clears throat> Where were we? Uh, pause at the moment in the discussion and say, I'm not sure I understand. Can you explain? Avoid saying that was unclear, right? Put the, put the burden of onus on yourself. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Instead of saying, you, you didn't do a good job. Try again, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Number seven. The moment you sense fear, frustration, anger, outrage, or disgust from your conversation partner, pay attention to the specific words they use. Fear, frustration, and the others are feelings. One of the best ways to sort out feelings, especially in strained conversations, is to listen and acknowledge them as soon as possible. Repeat specific feeling words. For example, I hear that. I understand your frustration. Acknowledgement through use of the same words can potentially direct the conversation away from the conflict. If nothing else, this demonstrates that you were listening. Number eight, if you start to fade or find yourself distracted when someone is talking to you, look them directly in the eyes and state, I'm sorry, can you please repeat that? If you find yourself, uh, yeah, yeah. Number nine, <clears throat> If you and your partner accidentally speak at the same time and your partner continues while you remain silent and listen, when you resume the conversation, do not do so with the words they cause the interruption. Let's say you're having a conversation and you interrupt each other. The last words you used were, so he told me. When you begin speaking again, do not start with, so he told me. This makes it seem like you didn't listen to anything your partner just said. Instead, use uh, when you resume, acknowledge your partner's point with alternative wording and continue with their thread of the conversation. Alternatively, let go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Ten. Do not pull out your phone when you are having a conversation. <laughs> Number eleven. Say I hear you to acknowledge you're listening. Mean it. I hear you. It is simple. 
yet effective. Okay, that wraps up number four, uh, listening. So now we're number five. I'm, I'm a little hesitant to use the word S-H-O-O-T when he says number five, shoot the messenger. So for TikTok, I'm going to skip over that word from now on. <laughs> Again, I, I wish they had just had a list of all the words we can say freely, <laughs> or the, actually the, or the words that get us in trouble. That's, <laughs> if you haven't seen George Carlin's The Seven Dirty Words, you need to watch that skit. And what inspired him was no one gave him a list. He had to figure out the words by trial and error. And that sparked, that was the ne uh, nexus of that whole skit. He was frustrated because the TV and radio networks wouldn't give him a list of the words he can't say. Yeah, TikTok, I hope you're listening. <laughs> I digress. Pew Pew the Messenger. <clears throat> have you ever thought you made a converse, uh, convincing case for a position only to have someone promptly reject your conclusion? This frequently occurs because people deliver messages at, uh, and the recipient rejects the act of delivery. Nobody likes to be lectured. Mm. Unless you pay thousands of dollars to go to college lecture, to be lectured at, but <clears throat> the research literature on effective conversations shows that delivering mes messages does not work. This is because messengers don't speak across political and moral divides, or even con converse. They deliver messages. Conversations are exchanges. Messages are information conveyed in one way or another. Messengers espouse beliefs and assume their audience will listen and ultimately embrace the con their conclusions. Even when messages messages are not delivered across any sort of political or moral divide, they tend to be poorly received. In the 1940s, the uh, philosoph psychologist, sorry, the psychologist Kurt Lewin and his students published a series of studies concerning an attempt to get housewives to incorporate sweetbreads or organ meats into home cooked meals to help with meat shortages during World War II. Some housewives were given a lecture about why incorporating sweetbreads was important for the war effort. Others were invited to self-generate reasons for their importance in group sessions similar to today's focus groups. Lewin observed that 37% of the members of the group who self-generated reasons followed through and incorporated sweetbreads, and in the lecture group, only 3% did. Uh, yeah, more about, uh, yep. <clears throat> All right. Delivering messages does not work. Here are some suggestions for shifting from a message delivery service to a conversation. Number one, distinguish between delivering a message and authentic conversation. Delivering a message feels like teaching, whereas a conversation has give and take that rewards with learning. If you find yourself thinking, if only there was... Uh, if they only understood this point, they'd change their mind, then you're delivering a message. Ask yourself, was I invited to share this, or am I just telling them? If it's the latter, you're probably coming across as a messenger. Number two, approach every conversation with an awareness that your partner understands problems in a way that you don't currently comprehend. You'll be less likely to deliver messages if you're more focused on figuring out how someone knows what they know than if you presume to understand the reasoning behind someone's conclusions. Don't meet their message delivery with your message delivery. That's not a conversation, but an invitation to debate. It's a message delivery service and a re recipe for frustration and deepening someone's commitment to their belief. Remember, nobody likes to be lectured. 
In tense conversations, people care more about their message than about those it seems to contradict. I'm sorry. Nobody likes to be lectured. In tense conversations, people care more about their message than about those it seems to contradict. Number four. When you realize your partner is being a messenger, do not shoot the messenger. Do not pew pew the messenger. If you... Mm, if you pew pew the messenger in your partner, you will destroy rapport and, many and may derail the conversation. If your partner enters messenger mode, begin a listening and learning mode centered on asking questions. Yeah, pull out the Socratic method. Works every time. Questions can be an effective way to nudge the conversation back on track. They are also integral to intervention techniques described in later chapters. Number five, deliver your message only upon your partner's explicit request. Be succinct, then return to the collaborative mindset that's centered upon listening and learning. Thank them for listening and ask if they have a reply. <clears throat> Thank them for listening and ask if they have a reply. Say, say, literally, quotes, thank you for giving me your op the opportunity to say that. I appreciate it. Any thoughts? What would you, li what would you like to add? <clears throat> I hope everyone's being civil in the comments. I'm not watching. I hope one of my moderators is here to pay attention. Yeah, it looks good, though. All right. Moving along. Ah, number six, <clears throat> interventions. We're ta Hi, welcome everyone who's new. We're talking about the seven fundamentals of having good conversations. I'm reading from Peter Bogosian's How to Have Impossible Conversations. Oh, I'm also recording this and I will be posting it on my YouTube channel. Same name, tech, Skeptic Talker. Um, I'm posting most of my live conversations there. Um, I don't do any editing though, so they're literally just recorded and dumped. Uh, I apologize for all the crude jokes and the buffering issues, but I ain't got time for that. <clears throat> Interventions. The following discussion between Socrates and Mino is from a classical text of Greek philosophy, the di dialogue Mino written by Plato in the 4th century BCE. I had to read this like three times. It is not easy to follow, but I'm going to try my best. <clears throat> Socrates says, <clears throat> it's, just, it's, so con it's so convoluted. Uh, I, I, maybe I should just take a picture and post it instead of stumbling through. Ah, I'm going to get through. Okay. Socrates, do you think some men desire bad and others good? Doesn't everyone, in your opinion, desire good things? Mino says no. Socrates, and would you say that the others suppose bad things to be good, or do they still desire them although they recognize them as bad? Mino, both, I should say. Socrates says, what? Do you really think that anyone who recognizes bad things for what they are nevertheless desire them? Mino says, yes. Socrates, desire in what way? To possess them? Of course, says Mino. In the belief that bad things bring advantages to their possession or harm, says Socrates. Mino says, some in their first belief, uh, some in the first belief, but some also in the second. Socrates says, and do you believe that those who suppose bad things bring advantage understand that they are bad? Mino says, no. That I can't really believe. Socrates says, isn't it clear then that this class who don't recognize bad things for what they are, don't desire bad, but what they think is good, though in fact it is bad. Those who through ignorance mistake bad things for good, obviously desire the good. Mino says, for them I suppose that is true. Socrates says, now as for those whom speak of as desiring bad things in in the belief that they do harm but their possessors these presumably know that yeah you see this this is just i'm so glad we do not speak like this anymore 
I'm going to cut to the chase. <laughs> I'm going to let Peter Bogosian cut to the chase. People don't knowingly desire bad things. That's the chase, right? Everyone believes, even though that it's a bad thing, they think it will do good for them. People do not desire bad. And... Uh, I guess we can all think of examples where some people do desire self-harm, right? There. There's an example. But even the most harmful, destructive vices, like escapism, you know, drugs, alcohol abuse, people know that they are bad, but they desire the good that comes from it. They still desire that the escapism, the numbing. <clears throat> in the Mino Socrates, <clears throat> in the Mino, what I just attempted to read, Socrates said that people do not knowingly desire bad things. Individuals act, believe, and desire based upon the information they have. If they had different information, they'd derive different conclusions. For example, physicians used to treat patients with leeches because they thought diseases were caused by an excess of blood. They attached leeches to patients because they wanted to help them. They desired the good, to improve patients' health. But they didn't have information we have now, which is that excess blood is unrelated to disease. We all have an impulse for goodness. However, lacking a comprehensive picture contributes to the failure of arriving at correct conclusions. When you encounter a person with radically different beliefs, you might think you're ignorant. <clears throat> I'm sorry, you might think they are ignorant, crazy, or malicious. Resist this inclination and instead consider that their view is issues from a different perspective, or that they're acting upon what they think is the best available information. Chances are far better that they mean to help but aren't great at communicating, <clears throat> and that they're actually ignorant. Oh, th they're just bad at communicating, rather than they're actually ig ignorant, crazy, or malicious. This is something I see a lot on TikTok. People the elevator doesn't go to the top floor, right? You, you just pick up on this sometimes. There's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's not useful to have a conversation with that person when, 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 when you're just talking past each other, right? To, ha to, to have a conversation that they can understand can be helpful and useful, but don't expect to change their mind. You want to have the conversation for the sake of the audience, so that the audience can examine both sides of the argument, no matter where in the conversation it is. Like you, we can have conversations about anything and use that as an example to show rational thinking, critical thinking skills, skepticism, building a better epistemology. So even simple conversations can be beneficial. Where was I? Lost my place. In a disagreement, people frequently assume their partner's intentions and motivations are worse than they are. Many people, for example, assume conversations are racist, liberals aren't patriotic, Republicans don't care about poor people, or Democrats are weak on national defense. They then go on to assume that these perceived shortcomings motivate beliefs and arguments. This is usually false. The intentions or motivations you assume in your conversation partners are likely worse than their actual intentions and motivations. For example, it is simple. It is simply not the case that most Republicans don't care about poor people. Rather, they're likely operating under the assumptions that opportunity trickles down through some job creation and that through love helps motivate people to raise themselves out of poverty. Yeah, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. 
Within this framework, cutting taxes on high income earners stimulates opportunities that trickle down to those who are economically disadvantaged. What matters isn't whether they are correct or incorrect, it's that their intention is to improve the bad situation, which is a far better motivation than many Democrats assume. Assuming your partner has malicious intentions stifles your conversation, it halts cooperation, and undermines the possibility of using the conversation to arrive at truth. It may also make your words seem snarky and put people on the defensive. Even more damaging to conversations is that making negative assumptions about your partner's intentions make you less capable of listening. If you must make assumptions about your partner's intentions, make only one, that their intentions are better than you think. People don't knowingly desire bad things. So assume your partner has good intentions. Uh, yeah, see internet trolls and psychopaths in chapter 7. Yeah. <clears throat> um, oh, how important is critical thinking? How important is critical thinking? Oh, we have a guest. It's the Chelsea. Oh, hello. Hello. How are you? Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Any thoughts? Um, what would you like to share? So I am liking the chapter so far, and I'm digging your reading. Um, I want to know what you think. I want to know what you're, like, what you're taking from this so far, what you think the most important things for other people to get from this is. Hmm. Mm, Share the yeah. wealth. Share the wealth, man. Share the wealth, right? This isn't this is this stuff isn't a secret. I want everyone to read and and think about how to have better conversations. Because we cannot solve any of the problems if we can't converse better. Right? And I mean we, you and I talk all the time about how to fix the world's problems. But I guess at the end of the day, it's communication skills. It's bettering our communication skills, right? We can't get money out of politics if we can't talk about it. We can't stop cutting down the rainforest if we don't talk about it. So I think communication may be the most fundamental linchpin in how do we overcome these great divides. Do you think there is a fundamental lack of communication in oh, yeah. oh, wait, 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 In older generations, younger generations, everyone, like if people just has the communication level fundamentally broken down and no one knows how to talk anymore, oh, or is there a certain group of people that are really good at talking to each other, or has just everybody stopped talking to each other altogether because of, you know, like money, anger, or. Yeah, that's such a great question. So my thoughts. first thought, my, my first <laughs> thought was um, there is a concerted effort, especially in modern media, corporate media, to otherize, tribalize, you know, us and them, because when you can divide, you can conquer. And that's promoted by the special interest groups that are buying the advertisement on said news platform. So there's, there's an and, and, and this, this also applies to our lack of critical thinking skills, lack of, um, I'm sorry, um, the lack of teaching critical thinking in schools, middle school and high school, uh, lack of civics courses. They're, they're not teaching children how to be skeptical by design. So fortunately, we live in the information world, the information age now, where this stuff is readily available. It just comes down to people's motivation to educate themselves, I'm afraid, so that we can vote for better politicians who write better legislation that pass funding bills for better education so that this cycle doesn't continue. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Oh, she disappeared. Oh, no. TikTok didn't like me. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I, I want to keep playing 20 questions, but I also really want to finish the no, chapter before uh, the half hour. So, yeah, hang out. If something comes up, interrupt me. Otherwise, um, did you want to uh, did you want to no, add no, anything no, no, to that no. last question or should? Okay, no, okay, okay. Thank you. Um, Here's how you can immediately apply this. Number one, if your partner assumes you have bad intentions, do not waste time trying to convince them otherwise. Instead, switch the conversation from your intentions to your reasoning. Say, I absolutely do not want to be wrong for one more instant than I have to be. If something is wrong with my reasoning, please let me know. Ah, I gotta write that one down. If you, number two, if you start to assume your partner has bad intentions, switch to a frame of curiosity. Consider that you may know something you do not know. Explicitly ask about the issue. Say, I'm having a hard time understanding why you're, where you're coming from. I assume you must know some things about this that I don't. Could you tell me more about where you're coming from so that I can understand better? How important is critical thinking? A hundred percent. I wish it told me how many people voted in that. <clears throat> well, every once in a while, I find uh -huh. I'm trying to figure out who is our like diehards and who is like just passing through. Yeah, I, I could share some of my analytics with you, but it's not granular, right? It just gives you percentages. Um, yeah, that's okay, not, number that's not helpful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, yeah. Number three, admit frustration. Say, I'm feeling frustrated. I want to understand where you're coming from. I'm also unclear about your intention. Could you tell me, what is your intention? This is an open-ended question that leaves room for interpretation. If they respond, what do you mean? What's your, what is my intention? Reply, what are your hopes for this conversation? What would you like to get out of it? Often, people you find frustrating are just trying to help. Equally often, they're doing so from the messenger stance. That's why they frustrate you. Pew pew the messenger. Do not feed the trolls. Oh my god, I say this all the time. And uh, there's a great skit. I gotta find it. Um, it used to be on Stephanie Miller's... Um, political comedy radio show. It was Troll Be Gone. She had she had this voice actor, and it was he was selling Troll Be Gone. <laughs> are are you suffering from trolls in your chat room? And then the trolls would be <laughs> buy Troll Be Gone, spray it liberally. <laughs> and it was this fake advertisement. It was so funny. So I used when I was on Facebook arguing with the trolls like a good internet warrior does. I should find some of my old Troll Be Gone memes. Uh, that's a blast from the past. <laughs> hmm. Don't feed the trolls. In internet speak, trolls are I, people who... I was just going to say, what, what in fact do the trolls eat, Brian? Don't feed the trolls, Brian. <laughs> Don't feed the trolls. Hmm. Trolls are people who have bad intentions and act maliciously. Trolls are toxic to conversations. Let them waste their time. Stop playing their game. Block or mute their accounts. You're under no obligation to engage someone whose goal is to irritate you. Never be bullied into having a conversation. Have a conversation because you want to, not because you are being harassed or for not speaking to someone. Consent applies to all participants. Don't feed the trolls. Um... Oh, I had a really good thought to share, but it's it's escaped me. Okay, but I just had a really good thought to share, so I'm just going to share it. Go. Yeah, go. So I feel like when somebody enters the conversation and they're just like, ah, and I'm like, I do not consent to this conversation. And then we just like let them leave. Yes. Or block them. Yeah, not every conversation is worth having for sure. Don't feed the trolls, right? If Someone if someone's being. feed on anger or negativity, emotional and intent. Oh, and attention. Oh. No, yes, agreed, no. But I was 
thinking more of the like mythological trolls? Is it like the blood of the children or is it like the head of Mark and the Cow and Frank? Like what is it like what are we eating here? Like it's important. My my thought returned. I often see a lot of comments in not just, you know, our chat here, but all, all over TikTok where people are genuinely asking questions that appears like they're being troll like, but they're not. And it's easy to, to mis mistake that. Um, and that's why I, I like to let, I, I, I don't like banning people from our conversation, even if they're being annoying, caps lock, it doesn't bother me until they're being malicious about it. So. Yeah, I, I pretty much get mad at hate speech. That's about it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Um, we're I on the last. Clever. We're on number seven of the fundamentals of good conversations. I'm just going to review real quick. Uh, to anyone that's joined us recently, I'm reading, I'm almost done with this chapter in Peter Bogosian's book. Um, loop, loop, loop how to have impossible conversations and we're talking about the seven fundamentals of good conversations and i just posted a really quick video uh, a picture of this so we can all review and we're on the last one now number seven walking away for years i peter have been developing interventions to change a sports fans team's preference for example, if someone likes the Dallas Cowboys, I have been trying to figure out what's to say to convince them to like the New England Patriots. My success rates have been abysmal. <laughs> the following is an attempted intervention I had with an LA Lakers fan. My first goal was to instill doubt about whether or not he should be a Lakers fan. And my second goal was to convince him to be a Trial Blazers fan. A Trail Blazers fan. Or an LA fan. Oh, L LA fan was approximately 28 years old. We met while waiting in line for, at a table, uh, for a table at a popular LA restaurant. Peter says, I just don't get it. The players on a team aren't even from LA, right? LA fan says, well, yeah. Peter says, where are they from? Uh, LA fan rattles off players and cities. Peter says, okay, got it. If they're from, uh, if they were from LA, then I could totally understand why you'd be a fan, right? I mean, they'd be from where they'd be, they'd be from here and they'd be kinship and fam familiarity and such, right? The fan says, well, yeah, but they're my team. This is my city. I love LA. Peter says, who doesn't? Great place. Well, I've been to L.A. twice. I'm a fluffy cloud, I'm a fluffy cloud, I'm a fluffy cloud. I'm a, I'm a fluffy cloud. <laughs> I'll tell some stories later. Mm. Um, Peter says, who doesn't? Great place. But the team is filled with people who aren't from here. The fan says, but they play for the city. They play for us. So when they win, we win. Peter says, would you feel more intensively, uh, intensely about the Lakers if every team member was from L.A.? Pause. I love those moments of reflection. Pause. The fan says, what do you mean? Peter says, I mean, if every single player on the team was born and raised in, a in Los Angeles, would you feel more strongly? Would you be more connected to the team? Pause. The fan says, maybe, yeah, maybe, I think so. Peter says, so shouldn't you be less enthusiastic and connected given that they're not from L.A.? I mean, if you'd be more enthusiastic if they're from L.A., then shouldn't you be less enthusiastic because they're not? Long pause. At this point, I should have ended the conversation on a light note. I should not have moved on to my second goal of changing his team. Uh, preference, his team preference. But I persisted and tried to guide him towards another team. The consequence of this was that he doubted, he doubled down on his Lakers enthusiasm and the tenor of the conversation changed. 
He became defensive and less curious. We were having fun, enjoyable chat about, um, and chat that I made less enjoyable and less fun, less fun because I pushed the conversation to where he became defensive. Exit stage left. Know when to walk away. Even when the conversation is going well, putting pressure on your partner to continue a discussion beyond their comfort level shuts down listening, encourages defensiveness, and turns the conversation into a frustrated rehearsal of why one of you is correct and the other is dense. Consequently, your conversation partner may double down on his views and the rapport between you will erode, possibly hurting your friendship. There may come a point when you've exhausted your options. Perhaps you have nothing left to say. You feel like you've been going around and around and you're, in a t you're at an impasse. A common mistake is to attempt to fix or reset conversations and then continue. Don't. Instead, part amicably. People need time to wrestle with doubt. Incorporate new information, mull over challenges, and different perspectives, and rethink their positions. And so do you. Changing one's mind happens slowly and in a very, in a way that suits one's individual psychology and habits. Over time, new beliefs and attitude uh, integrate with or entirely replace existing ones. Forcing a conversation beyond someone's comfort zone denies you and your partner an opportunity to reflect while placing a strain on the relationship. Politely leaving a conversation when all parties are getting along can be an opportunity for those involved to reflect on issues. Finally, try to end up on a positive note. Sometimes even a simple, thanks for chatting with me, is sufficient. How to end a conversation. <clears throat> Here are some suggestions for knowing when to end a conversation. Number one, end the conversation if your uh, primary emotion is frustration. If the discussion escalated to anger, you may need to walk away sooner than expected. Number two, breathe. Are you a fluffy nice cloud today? Deep breaths. Yeah, I've had a good day. Only minor, minor bit of stress over some mundane paperwork. Nothing to worry about. Well, that's good. Initial, when you initially feel yourself becoming frustrated, back off. Slow down. Don't feel pressures to fill pauses with speech. And breathe. Take a deep breath. If you do not calm down, end the conversation and walk away. Or hit disconnect. <laughs> <clears throat> Number three. If someone wants to end the conversation, politely thank them for speaking with you. Don't engage someone past their comfort threshold. Number four. <clears throat> Number four, if you think you have caused your partner to doubt one of their beliefs, that is a good time to stop the conversation. So I just Allow, that. yeah. I think that's where the, we've come to talk to you about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think that's the part that they miss. That like, you have to stop when people don't want to talk anymore. And to continue to, like, push and push and re-show up at their house just, like, puts a sour taste in their mouth. Sure. I think they I think they miss that part because they're so determined to save. Yeah. 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 They're they're on a mission. Really. L literally, missionaries are on a mission, right? They have to no. bring it. They have to shepherd as many souls into the happy place as they possibly can. <laughs> because you they believe that's God's, true. God's clock in their hours, man. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Allow them to just ah, <clears throat> allow them to explore their doubt and to wonder about it on their own terms. 
if they continue to express curiosity, state that this is a good opportunity for both of you to think about these issues. You can then part ways or change the subject, depending upon the context. Attempting to fill your partner's doubt and wonder Um, sorry, attempting to fill your partner's doubt and wonder with your beliefs is sometimes genuinely educational, but it can also be a form of evangelism. Don't evangelize. It is unethical, unethical abuse of the vulnerability that accompanies doubt to use it in an attempt to sway your partner. I see that all the time on Christian talks when they're, when they're, showing off how they bring young kids into their belief because children are doubtful, right? So they interject their fear and their wrath and their solution, right? Religion gives you a crutch, uh, gives you a limp so that it can offer you the crutch. It tells you how you're sinful and dirty and wrong at birth. There's nothing you can do about it except Follow us. We offer the solution. Uh, plus, be generous when the collection plate comes around. <clears throat> Number five, thank your partner when you end the conversation. The more you do not want to thank someone for the conversation, the more important it is to thank them. There, an ex there is an exception for this. For example, if someone was smearing or harassing you, um, Sorry, reticence to think your conversation partner suggests. Reticence, I just don't know what that word means. R-E-T-I-C-E-N-C-E. -E -E. I gotta look that up. <clears throat> uh, ba -ba -ba. Thanking someone for their time is a basic courtesy. Thanking someone will also help conversations end on an upbeat, friendly note. In conclusion... <clears throat> You now have the fundamentals necessary for effective civil conversations. We urge you to practice this material before attempting to apply the techniques in this next chapter. The greater your mastery of the content in this chapter, the more success you will have when applying more advanced techniques. Notably, you do not need to seek out conversations. Opportunities present themselves in day-to-day -day interactions with co-workers, checkout clerks, waitstaff, roommates, friends, relatives, and so forth. Simply go about it is an opportunity to practice being a kinder, more effective communicator. Becoming a better listener and partner in conversations can only have a positive effect on your relationships. Start now. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we've maintained over 30 people consistently, which is fantastic. Um, it's 540. It yeah, it's 540. I don't have but like five minutes. Um, this chat is recorded. I'm going to post it on YouTube. So please feel free to share it with anyone. Um, if you can, please pick up a copy of this book. Treat it better than you would the Bible. <laughs> and maybe we can all have better conversations. I do see a guest waiting, so I want to bring them in super quick. Uh, but while I do, Chelsea, any final thoughts? Um, Diver oh, wants you to do another four-hour live of uh, playing game. Hey, Chelsea. Hello, hello. Hi, Somnantis. I'm so glad it's you. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Chelsea. What, sorry, Chelsea. What were you saying? Uh, Diver wants you to do another four-hour stream of... I've been looking into... So I, I promise you I will put more time into it. No guarantees it will happen, but I would like to. Because I, I do practice a lot of escapism by just kicking back and playing video games. And if I can share it, with you guys and share the entertainment 
that's a good thing, right? <laughs> so, uh, wants, thanks, Diver. He wants uh, your last achievement, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know, one, one last achievement in Ori. Beat the game in under four hours. I need to do some homework. I need to, like, write out my path. Hit this, and then that, and that. <laughs> All right, Somnantis. Uh, yeah, super nerd. What's on your minds, my friends? Oh, I was just listening to you guys, like, read this book about how they um, proselytize. The, the guidance for proselytizing. And it, and it just made me think, you know, I've been thinking a lot about narcissistic personality disorder lately. And like, I, I find that, you know, Christians aren't a monolith. Like they, they are, there's a wide gradient of Christians. Some are very conservative. Some are very progressive. There's some in, in the middle. Um, but what I've noticed is uh, like, there is this group of like, not only like conservative Christians, but like there's a group of people uh, and all these issues kind of go together, uh, whether we're talking about gender identity or, you know, um, aid to the poor and poor working families or um, all the LGBTQIA issues, uh, all they seem to all center around like, like they have the same points on the same issues. Mm-hmm. And it just made me think about like narcissistic personality disorder where it's, it's almost like they're sharing notes, right? They have, they have a very similar um, form of apologetics. They have been trained this way. This is a learned behavior. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and so I was having like a, uh, I was writing back and forth with somebody about narcissistic personality disorder and abuse, emotional abuse. And, you know, it kind of comes down to like, Every person is a unique individual. We have a unique constitution. We have a unique lived experience in the world. And as such, you know, our wants and desires are based upon our uniqueness, our unique experiences. And so we, when things happen in the world, we see them in a certain way. We feel about them in a certain way. We think about them in a certain way. In gaslighting is what happens when somebody comes in and says, Oh, no, you didn't see that. Oh, your yes. feelings are about your lived experience and your perceptions are wrong. You know, it's one thing for you, for anybody to have an opinion for themselves, how they perceive the world, how they think about the world, how they feel about the things that their lived experience is showing them. But when you start telling people that, well, no, you you don't have a right to think think that no you don't really feel that that's gaslighting that's narcissism you know and so they're just like this book is just like sharing notes on how how do we foist our view on everybody else and just ignore their lived experience Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's all i'm just (laughs) yeah i'm I'm so glad you could join us and share that thought because you always have insightful things to say and I appreciate you. And I wish I had, uh, so, I, um, I hear you <clears throat> wrapping it up. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got yeah. to log off, but maybe I'll be back later tonight. Okay. And I hope to see you again soon. All right. All right. Hey, skeptic. Hey, Chelsea. Hey, hey. adios, you guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Adios. Muchacho. Let's do it. All right. I got to go. I got to go make some food. I'm really hungry. Um, yeah, Chell, if you're up for it later, um, let's, let's come back online and have some good conversations. Or at least try. Someone said Lisa needs a smoke. What?